Hello, I'm Steve Hassan, and uh, I have a very special guest uh, uh, to interview this morning, Eileen Johnson, who I met at the ICSA conference in, in Manchester, England, earlier this summer, and she's uh, down in Australia. Thank you so much, Eileen, for making time. I believe it's very late at night where you are, and it's early in the morning here in Boston, right? Right. So Eileen, we did a short video interview when we were together and I said, please, let's do a longer one. I want more details of your story. And I think since the time we met this summer, you've had a chance to look at combating cult mind control and review the bite model more in detail. Why don't we just start with introducing yourself and how you, you were recruited into Opus Day and some of the key points that you'd like to share with our listeners. Yeah, um, it goes back a lot of years, really. Uh, but but the reason I'm still involved in this debate about Opus Day is because I think that the procedures are still very similar, and the damage that can be inflicted on, especially young people who are recruited too young, uh, it, this is still going on, and it concerns me a lot. Um, I was. I would say groomed by my young French teacher in my last year, no, in my second last year at secondary school. It was a convent grammar school in Middlesbrough, Yorkshire. And um, I loved French, it was my favorite subject. And in fact, I, I really wanted to go on to become a French teacher. Mm -hmm. And I was a good all-rounder at school and, and a good singer as well. And um, she befriended me. I had no, I'd never heard of Opus Dei and I had no idea that she was a member, obviously. She befriended me and made me feel very special. And towards the end of the year, she asked me, would I go to Manchester to help with an international summer school for foreign girl students? Mm -hmm. uh, and she said uh, I would probably improve my French if I went there. Mm -hmm. um, my parents were delighted at the idea and um, gave permission. I was um, not quite 17 at the time when she invited me. I was 17 when I, I did go. I went for two weeks during my school summer holidays and um, she, she by then had moved and she was living in the students' hostel in Manchester. Right, I think in the interest of time, Eileen, details yes. are great, but yep. you were involved in leadership in the UK for a, a long time, and I'd like to, to, to just emphasize the point that you were groomed, which is a trafficking term, uh, actually, and, and Keith Ranieri and Nexium was found guilty of sex trafficking. There's labor trafficking also, and I believe that destructive cults do traffic and they do groom underage people by by flattering them telling them what they want to hear yeah using the yeah. bait that they're interested in and and i and when we when when we did the interview you said that you were told not to even tell your parents at the point that you were um recruited into opus day am i misremembering? yes yeah absolutely Correct? yeah yeah yeah. I joined Opus Dei within a year of that first visit, mm -hmm. although within a few months of that first visit, I did join as a supernumerary, as a member who could still get married. But then, not long after that, I became a numerary. And on both of those occasions of joining, I was told not to tell my parents. Yeah. Right. And for those who don't know, uh, the Catholic Church is huge, uh, and Opus Dei is a personal preliture of yeah. which popes set up? Uh, John Paul II. John Paul II. And it's like got an independent entity within the Catholic Church. Yeah. And that, mm -hmm. in fact, I've met numerous Catholic priests who didn't like Opus Dei at all, didn't like their yes. practices, was very opposed to it. And yet it's got this life of its own that's yeah. very political, very uh, uh, extreme. So tell us more. So you were, you were recruited in the UK and you were out, yeah. how many years in total were you involved? 
Um, from when I became a supernumerary, nearly 11 years. Right, and the term supernumerary is a celibate person? No, the, the, the supernumeraries are married members or members who are able to get married. Able to they're, get married. They're not, they're not committed to celibacy. like um, Right, numerary. and people who are numeraries are celibate? Am yes. I remembering that correct? And then they, they could become priests if they were men, uh, if they went into the higher Yeah, uh -huh. Yeah, uh, uh, a minority of them. Right. More, more priests have been ordained for Opus Dei since it became a personal preliature. I think that, that that's connected. There's a connection there. Right. So, so you were tell tell us more of the essentials of your story that you'd like our our listeners to understand about Opus Dei, please. Um, one point which you 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 it was. A thought that you sowed in my mind in our original interview in Manchester um, when I talked about um, Opus Dei channeling young people's um, I don't know idealism whatever and you said and sublimating the, and so uh, sublimation and interestingly uh, I, I took that point up with a friend of mine who is a former Opus Dei priest the whole concept of sublimation, and he's very, very knowledgeable. And um, he said the question of sublimation is 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 a very personal decision. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody wants to sublimate those sexual energies or whatever, if 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 that becomes necessary because of what they deeply and personally feel is is a, a vocation to a celibate life, then that is a very deeply considered personal decision and i i really feel that in my case and many others opus day takes that choice away and yeah. imposes it through a form of brainwashing through a form of form of coercion right and i just want to add in the moonies the cult that i was in i was 19 years old and uh, dating women and actually sexually active and I enjoyed my youth and had no interest whatsoever in becoming celibate and yet through the indoctrination in the moon cult uh, I was brainwashed to think masturbation was evil and, yes. and, and, yes. and any sexual thought I couldn't be alone with a woman so all of my energy got pushed to recruiting and indoctrinating people. So that, well, this, this, that this sublimation. Is, this is a point that over recent years particularly uh, has really been of concern to me because I know of um, young people who have gone through Opus Dei schools. I, mean, I know of two young men who are now young men who um, were brought up in an Opus Dei boys school and they're, they're grilled, they're, they're, they're questioned about the intimate detail of their sexuality from puberty mm -hmm. and made to feel that masturbation is sinful. Yes. I mean, that's from when they're 12, 13. Yeah, it's, it's that's an old, uh, you know, uh, Orthodox Jewish thing that spilling the seeds yes. is a sin. So therefore the Catholic Church, you know, in its, in its uh, uh, more uh, conservative uh, versions uh, take that literally. Uh, uh, but we know so much more now about psychology and biology uh, and what's yeah. normal and healthy and and self-control <laughs> and self-control of course so, um, so tell us more about you know how you got so immersed in Opus Dei and and what you learned as a devotee and in, in the higher highest levels of women, the women's branch in the UK? Well, the more I think about it, the more I wonder how I stayed in for so long, because um, I, I was easy prey, because uh, it's part of the fact I was in love with my first boyfriend, who also was uh, a target and also joined Opus Dei as a numerary eventually. But um, I, I also, prior to meeting him, I had quite seriously been considering becoming a nun. Mm. I also 
throughout my secondary education became very interested in religion and in um, the teachings of the Catholic Church and I was very very thoughtful about all that and quite serious uh, in spite of the fact that there's another side to my personality that's very human very I don't know anyway and um, just um, One reason I say I wonder why I stayed in was precisely because of religious education, because I, I realized after I joined Opus Dei, who always said that their, their, their lay members have a level of um, doctrinal and, 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 and philosophical education equal to priests. Mm -hmm. The level that I reached in Opus Dei was not as advanced as what I had reached towards the end of my schooling. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And like in my schooling, it was largely based on Thomas Aquinas' teaching. And um, um, right, but you were telling me that you were reading all of the 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 uh, guidance letters from 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 uh, the headquarters yeah i made a note oh i think this was something from your book um about cults a, a, a promise of life something about a promise of life in idealistic and in, in an idealistic fantasy world an elite status in a better society to come I think my own idealism as a, as, a, as a Catholic teenager was very much about converting the world to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And Opus Dei presented itself to me as the most modern and vibrant way to go about that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's, prob that's probably how I, um, I stayed in so long because that, that ran deep and also out of a sense of commitment and loyalty even though at another level there were a lot of doubts being raised. Right, and you, you did look at the BITE model um, of behavior yes. control and information, thought and emotion. Yes, control, I did, yeah. And the influence continuum. So tell us your, your reactions to hearing about my model. And yes, I've got them here, B-I-T-E. Um, I think the behavior control was, the, that's where I double I double ticked the ones that were definitely <laughs> aspects of Opus Dei, and I think behavior control came up almost clearest. Uh, uh -huh. The promotion of dependence and obedience. Yes. Blind obedience. I mean, in the book, the way which is publicly available, the founder, Monsignor Escriva, now Saint Jose Maria, um, talked about blind obedience to your superiors. Mm -hmm. Of course, that, that's, a, that's a concept that carries through from monastic life, I suppose. But in Opus Dei, it's very, very blind. I mean, and I've known various monastic priests who, who do have freedom of thought and who come up with some really original ideas as individuals. Yes. Um, uh, restrict or control sexuality, I've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, very strict. Um, regulate what and how much you eat and drink. I've, I've questioned that one, except that I have to say that I was introduced to more varieties of alcohol in Opus Dei than I'd ever seen or, or, or drunk before. That's interesting. That is interesting. That's the opposite yeah. of most of the religious cults that I've worked with that restrict uh, use of alcohol. Really? Mm-hmm. I began to like it a bit too much after well, when I be, when I began to be unwell and depressed. Mm -hmm. De deprivation of sleep. Well, um, I didn't have a problem with that for my first two or three years because I was still sleeping on a mattress because I was in a student's hostel mingling with the other students, and so I shared rooms with them for apostolic reasons. Yeah. Um, but once. I did start sleeping on the floor or on a board every night. That was real sleep deprivation. It was, uh -huh. That was very, very difficult. 
And, and did you yeah. have the uh, Scyllus? The... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people don't know that what that is. Up. Can you explain what that is? Well, it's, it's like, um, it's about this thick, it's a piece of metal with, with, with spikes on the inside, mm. which you, you tie around your thigh so that the spikes kind of, you know, it's very uncomfortable. So Particularly when you're sitting do down. Take the skin, or it's just a pressure. Well, it depends how tight you tie it. Um, yeah. But it, 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 even if it doesn't break the skin, it marks the skin. Mm -hmm. I know one person who says, and she's my age now. She's in her seventies, and she's she's fair skinned, and she says she still has the marks from, and she was she wasn't in for all that long actually. Interesting. So um, is it is it fair to say that you know many former members of Opus Dei? No, I I have found it very difficult to maintain contact with anybody from Opus Dei, either people who remained in Opus Dei or, or others who left. Um, one way that I came across a few who had left was because I went public in 1991 about, you know, about the beatification of the founder. And through that, it has a sort of snowball effect when you go public and um, through through a bit of networking then I discovered that several of the people I'd known when I was a member were still in. But um, in, in, in my culture in, in England, and that includes Ireland, I, I, I found that most others who left after a number of years weren't really interested in keeping in touch. I think they just wanted to forget it all. Yeah, that's very common. And constant. remain anonymous. Yeah, that's very, very common. In fact, they'd say it's more rare for people to speak out publicly and say, yes, I was in a cult group and, you know, they lied to me and they abused me and, you know, I, yeah. I did get out. Um, so give us a little bit more meat of what you want to the public to understand about the problems with a group like Opus Dei. Well, one of the things that I, I feel most strongly about and that I have tried and I still will try to speak out about is their lying to the public. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, if I can tell you a little story about Miguel Fizak. He was a founder member of Opus Dei. He was actually the chauffeur to the founder for quite a long time. Uh -huh. And he was also as, as an architect, and he became one of Spain's most prestigious 20th century architects. Hmm. He was for a long time the, the only person bringing in a wage in the small group of, of, of founder members. Mm -hmm. And Miguel left after 19 years, and within a year he married, and he and his wife had three children. and. Um, the third little girl died as an infant mm. and on the day of the funeral Miguel was visited by two Opus Dei priests to tell him that this was God's punishment for him leaving Opus Dei. Oh my god, that's terrible. Yeah, I know, but... So in other words, the, 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 was, do you think the founder sent these Opus Dei people to make him... Well, I don't know. I don't know. But I think this was a sort of fairly typical thing that used to happen. Um, but I'll, I'll go on to tell you that after I went public in 1991, I heard this story and I went to Spain to interview several former members, and one of whom was Miguel Fisac. And it was such a lovely visit. It's a beautiful house that he'd designed himself. And I met him and his wife, who was a novelist, and I got this story direct from him. Mm. And after I went back home to Scotland, um, I had occasion to write a letter to the Scottish Catholic Observer because there was a lot of pro Opus Dei stuff being printed around that time. And I wrote a letter uh, and I briefly mentioned this story. And the following week, or two weeks or so later, there was a reply from the Opus Dei Information Office in London saying that they had contacted their Madrid information office and no such visit ever took place. Amazing. So I, fa I faxed this reply to Miguel Fisac, and he wrote, 
to the Scottish Catholic Observer and his, and his letter was, was printed and he said it did indeed take place and he named the two priests and the date and the time. Wow. Yeah. So he proved that they were lying officially. From yes, the well, that, that's my biggest uh, kind of example of, I, I've been, I've been, key, I know how much they distort the truth. Mm. And um, they always, whenever there's anything as negative as that about their reputation, they always find a way to, or they try to find a way to deny it. So can I ask a question? Um, the, 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 the information center that put out this falsehood, uh, there's such a center in Washington, D.C. called the Catholic Information Center, which is a prelature. So, of, which is not quite the same as an Opus Dei information center, although I know that of their influence in that well, Catholic but it is, yeah. but it is Opus Dei. It's run by Opus yes. Dei according yes. to their own website. So, yes. And, yes. And, and the Attorney General William Barr, currently of the United States of America, was on the board of directors of this information center in Washington. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, so. you you know that this um, desire to um, infiltrate high places is a foundational thing that as i said in my talk in um, manchester um escriva stated quite openly from the beginning that his aim was to recruit the aristocracy of blood money and talent that's very important actually and it connects with the theme of my forthcoming book, The Cult of Trump, and other groups like The Family uh, that was started by Abraham Baridi, and it was explicitly the same idea, but Protestant oriented, seemingly, uh, but to recruit elites, people with power, money, and connections into this. Well, yeah, and, and Escriva really distorted Christian scripture to illustrate his own aims. Mm. He, there's, a, there's a verse in scripture where Jesus is reported as saying, when I am lifted up, well, one thinks of him on the cross, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And he gives that as a validation of him wanting to, as he's used to say, to place Christ on the pinnacle of all human activity. Mm -hmm. So as to draw the rest of the world up. Yeah, but was he saying that people would follow him or was he saying people would follow Jesus? Well, he was saying that if, if he got members of, of his organization into high places, that they would Christianize society from right. there. Right. So well, Jesus, Jesus did somewhat the opposite, it seems, you know, with fishermen and Humble people. Absolutely. Well, that's part of the hypocrisy of, of groups claiming they're doing Jesus's work and then, then uh, being so uh, mean and nasty to immigrants and to poor people and to... to, uh, to well, Opus Dei, now, I, I mentioned something to you today, actually, that, mm -hmm. that I've, I've read this article, which I thought was really very, very relevant. This is um, a guy called Grover Corcoran, whose son-in-law was a supernumerary. This is in Ireland, I think. Uh, and he says, Opus Dei is not a conservative organization. It is a chameleon organization. Chameleons, uh-huh. Chameleon, yeah. So he says, Opus Dei people are conservative when they're among conservatives, but liberal when among liberals. Whatever serves Opus Dei's purpose of garnering influence, favorable publicity, money, and power. Amazing. And I, that, that, that chameleon is a word I've, I've used quite a few times over the years, because um, in, in, in the days when Opus Dei was in its earlier years in Spain, you know, with, with Franco and the fascist government and everything, uh, they were they were both in social terms and in church terms known to be conservatives, and um, 
a young man that I know who, who went through an Opus Day school in Madrid a few years ago said that his religious education teacher stated that the only true way to be a Christian was to be a socialist. And well, because Spain had right. Spain was, had gone through into a socialist. Right, and then liberation theology of helping. An anti-fascist time, mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I really do think they're very like a chameleon. Which, um, yeah, except for me, chameleons uh, use their ability to change their coloration for defensive purposes so they don't get eaten. I think of groups like uh, cults as more predatory organizations yes. that are harming people and using deception yes. the trick well, well that's true because actually he goes on to say i haven't i haven't noted it he goes on to 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 a sort of simile with a leopard rather than a chameleon a leopard leopard is stealthy and um is able to change its tack according to its prey I don't know whether I got these words from your book as well, but to influence, there are three words here, deception, flattery, and trickery. A trickery is another thing which the founder actually taught. I see. He said that in the work of God, dirty tricks were permissible. Yeah, well, Moon said that uh, God tells lies often. <laughs> and if you tell a lie for a good reason, which means to promote the group, it's a good thing. Yeah. That was my former cult leader. So, uh, Eileen, you were, you were involved in leadership for a number of years and read these, these documents, and, but, but the, 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 the average people did not see the things that you saw. That's right, uh, yeah. Is that correct? So tell yeah. us one or two things that you saw that, that stick with you that you'd like to share. If, if, you're, if you're willing. Well, I remember more than one document about the Jesuits. They, and they weren't referred to by name. In Spanish, they were referred to as los de siempre, which means the usual ones. Mm -hmm. and, and he was giving um, instructions as to how to deal with them, what so to mean say. So he didn't to... like the Jesuits? No, but the Jesuits didn't like him either. And that was why, you know, it was mutual. Um, they, they used to say that the problem was the Jesuits were jealous of Opus Dei because it was beginning to usurp their place, particularly as regards education. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm recovering from this cold, I'm sorry. Oh, no um, worries. I... Um, the 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 chaplaincy, the Catholic chaplaincy at Manchester University was Jesuit. Jesuits were in charge there, and um, I remember the chaplain, who was a very nice person actually. He was very worried about me. He was worried about what was going on, where I was living. Mm -hmm. um, no, they, they they weren't at all keen. But um, certainly, I, I I don't know. Escrivá was very negative about them. Right. Um, he was negative also about popes. He would regularly say, there are many popes, only one founder. Meaning him and, and he, the founder. Yeah, Is that what yeah, you mean? absolutely. <laughs> so he's putting himself above popes. Yeah, yeah. Well, particularly popes he disagreed with. Uh -huh. and, and maybe that was to do with whether they liked Opus Dei or not, I don't know, but... Um, he very much disliked good Pope John, mm -hmm. John the Twenty Third, and he wasn't keen on. on um, oh, who was the? Oh, I've forgotten the name. Pardon my senior moment. <laughs> the the one who uh, Pope, um, Pope Paul the Sixth was it? The one who followed um, good Pope John. The big development, of course, was um, it was after he died though when when. Um, John Paul II came on the scene. That was excellent news for Opus Dei. He was very negative about popes, very negative about the rest of the church. Interesting. 
And was there uh, sexual abuse in Opus Dei? I know that mm -hmm. Mikulowski, who is head of the Catholic yeah. Information Center in DC, I know uh, they paid off almost a million dollars to a woman. He I, I know that's a sore point to friends of mine whom I know have left Opus Dei with no pension. You know that they can afford to pay nearly a million dollars to. to to clear their name, but uh, but they can't afford to help people who have been left with no pension, people who've been working for them for years. Yeah, well, it wasn't to clear the name, it was just to stop a, a lawsuit and bad publicity. Well, uh, yeah, that's true, uh, yeah, that's true. He, he, he was apparently uh, not, a, not a moral person, um, even though he recruited top politicians into uh, the organization. Well, there's the case in Bilbao as well of the um, the schoolboy who who was reportedly abused by his Opus Dei tutor, his uh, numerary teacher. Mm -hmm. The um, the teacher in question was sentenced to twelve years in prison mm -hmm. uh, last year, but he's still not in prison because. Um, the Opus Dei school has disagreed with the verdict. Uh -huh. So they're appealing. Is this in Scotland? They're appealing. Is that they're appealing. Uh -huh. But the, there's a very heavy Opus Dei influence in the judicial system in Madrid. Oh, it's in Spain. I see. And so pending, you know, going to the high court, this guy is still not in prison. Right. So, and then you to had told me that you um, had suffered depression after a number of years in the group and they insisted yeah. you go to a Opus Dei um, a psychiatrist and... Uh, well, no, f first of all, it was a, an Opus Dei GP who was a, GP. a colleague of mine on the advisory, the, 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 the committee in London that ran the, uh -huh. the women's section in Britain. And um, yeah. I wasn't given any choice. I, 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 th I was still totally in, in Opus Dei and brainwashed, even though I was ill. Um, so first of all, she, she, she brought me Librium and Tofranil, and then a bit later on gave me Lithium as well, and then eventually took me to a male numerary psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, something I got from your... Um, your bite no um yeah you mentioned gaslighting to make people doubt their own memory mm -hmm. i think gaslighting it helped me here i think gaslighting is like mm, shifting the blame onto the other person isn't it or is that is that what it is <clears throat> it's a process of making the person think they're crazy by yeah. For example, saying things and then denying you ever said it, or doing things and denying you ever do it, did it, or well, the, this well, this is actually I, I did get to the point of questioning my own sanity, definitely. And uh, one thing that I really remember when I was taken to the psychiatrist, I I told him that my problem was expressing my feelings. And I remember him saying to me, well, feelings are all very well as long as you channel them. And he also said to me that I was a late developer. Mm -hmm. And so that, that contributed to my beginning to question my maturity and my sanity. But, you know, when you think about it, how could I channel my feelings when prior to being in Opus Dei, I used to sing and I used to dance and I had a boyfriend. <laughs> right. I mean, I, there was no way that I could correct that right. because we weren't allowed to go out to, you know, to, to do these things. Right. To sing or to dance or... Yeah, and it's thought stopping and emotion blocking, which are two different aspects of the bite model, uh, where you're taught that thoughts uh, and feelings that don't go along with the ideologically totalist group are bad and wrong. So you have to suppress them or channel them. Or yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, I just want to comment as a mental health professional 
that one of the ethical guidelines that's very clear uh, is that that the professional always needs to put the client or the patient and their best interest ahead of anything else, ahead of you as a practitioner. And certainly there's a, there's a very strict ethical guideline against what's called a dual relationship. For example, if, if, if I'm, if I'm in, a, in my Jewish temple and I'm working with a member of the temple who's questioning Judaism and wants to leave, and if I am trying to keep him in the temple versus encouraging him to do what he needs to do for his well-being, that's considered a, a, va a very important ethical violation. And I feel like the, what, the way they treated you was a gross violation of medical ethics. Um, well, the way they treated me and many, many others uh -huh. Because I think one one thing that's common, certainly I, I've spoken to the former Opus Dei priest about this, and he says it was the same for him. I thought it was just me. For many years, I thought that I was the only one that had these sorts of problems with Opus Dei, that the others had stayed in and been able to be faithful, but I had had to come out because I, for some reason or other, wasn't the right material to be faithful. And um, for many years, I thought that I was the only one that had been treated medically in that way, but I now realize that there are hundreds and hundreds of people who've had that treatment and still are. Right, and I just wanna underscore, Eileen, it's the same with every destructive cult. Every person, because of isolation, because of information control, is told that it's their issue, their problem, their fault, their lack of spiritual progression, their bad karma. And it's only when you get out that you can reality test and go, no, 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 it was the group. It was the be practice. Well, yeah, but it took, me, it took me many years to realize that. Yes. In fact, I, th I think it took me until I went public, 20 years after I left. Yeah. And, and uh, so when I wrote Combating 30 years ago, 1988, it's 31 years now, um, people were reading it, curious about the Moonies, and then reading it and going, you wrote about my group, because the patterns fit. Yep, yep. And, and it's easier to see it in another group than, than your yep. former group. It's, yeah. Oh, that's so obvious that Moon isn't the Messiah and he's not speaking for God and it's wrong for him to tell people to lie, to recruit and to cut people off from their families and their education <laughs> and their goals and their dreams and their loved ones. Um, but once you see it clearly over there, then you can begin a self-reflection process and a memory retrieval process where you go, I actually had a similar experience. Yeah, or I have other friends who had experiences like that and such. Yeah, and and it's so important, isn't it, for people to know that they're not the only one? Yeah, because it's a help, isn't it? It 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 helps to liberate you. Exactly, it, you know, knowledge is 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 power, and and for me, understanding brainwashing and mind control as it was done by Chinese communists right? Because I was in a cult that indoctrinated me to think communism was Satan. For me to look at communism and look at their patterns of, of influence and control and manipulation, it was really obvious. And then I could start looking at, well, how did the Moonies recruit and indoctrinate people? And the patterns were all the same, basically. Um, and that's where the light bulbs went, went on and said, wait a minute, there's something profound here about the human mind and how we can be influenced uh, consciously and unconsciously by people in our environment, especially authority figures we give um, um, uh, credit to, people we think are legitimate authority figures. But we also, we gauge a lot by the people we're around who are in the same group especially people if we like them or we can identify with them that they're yeah. with us we're going to to uh follow 
um, more often than not. So I think it, the numbers are about two thirds of, of everybody will conform. Uh, even if they're shown a, lo a, a line that's a different size than the sample line in a social psychology experiment known as the ASH conformity study, two thirds will start saying the wrong answer just to fit in because they'll doubt themselves. There's something obviously wrong with my eyes because everyone is saying line three is the right answer, although it looks like line one is the right answer. And nobody gets up to measure in the, in the group conformity test either, which is what I say to my clients. It's like, if you can ever reality test with an objective measure, <laughs> and you don't have to trust other people, do it. <laughs> and for example, your 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 story with the former chauffeur of the founder of the Opus Day, uh, you know, where where the group is saying it never happened, and he's like, "This man came, this man came, this was the date. Yes, it did happen." When you when you can you know uh, look at facts and then see that they lied, it's like. You can't you can't put that one back in the box. Oh, by the way, also Miguel Fisak was debarred from giving witness for prior to the beatification of the founder of Opus Dei because he was deemed to be psychologically unbalanced. So, if for the for the average person watching this, the founder was made officially into a saint. Correct beatification. Yeah, be, the, it, it take, there are two stages. First is beatification, and then ten years after that is canonization, depending on miracles being worked by the the saintly person. So was the founder just beatified, or is is? is was, oh, he's canonized. He, he he's was beatified canonized. in 1992 and canonized in 2002. So in other by, words, by John Paul II, the man who was his chauffeur who was with him for years and years and years, who wanted to give testimony contrary to why he shouldn't get this high status within the Catholic yeah. Church. They said, nope, he's, he, he's no good. He's, he's psychologically yeah. unstable, so we're yes. not going to listen to any of his evidence. That Opus, Dei, Opus Dei said that, yes. Yeah. Because they were heavily involved at the Vatican level in, in the process of beatification. So, so it was just corrupt politics. Yeah. How it looks it like. Was, yeah. Sounds like to me. So um, we're going to need to to finish up soon, Eileen, in the next five minutes or so. What else would you like, you know, to say? I, I believe you would like to uh, write a book um, and publish a book. Oh, I've, I've got it just about finished, yeah. Uh-huh. So anyone watching this who wants wants to help you find a good publisher, a mainstream publisher, you asked, I believe, uh, to find, um, uh, will know how to get in touch with you. And, well, yeah, and that's great. Because, you know, there's only so much you can say in an hour's interview. And it's it's a bit like after I gave a talk to the Catholic Writers Guild in 1993 after the canonization, um, I was asked by the the chairman afterwards to put something in writing because um, this this medium, for example, is is very helpful and very good, but sometimes people just want to sit and mull over things. Think sure. you know the written word is very useful as a backup, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. And uh, there's quite a lot of detail. And I try to make it as readable as possible. Yeah. Actually, I had an idea while I was over here. I, I've decided that my, my closing chapter is about Chanel number no. five. Oh, now you've got <laughs> my curiosity. How so? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> ah, so I have to read the book to find I out. discovered Chanel number no. five when I was in Opus Uh huh. But it's something that that's something that has appealed to me ever since and it uh -huh. still does uh -huh. and I intend to I intend to provide myself with a new bottle as soon as possible <laughs> I see that's one a... needs these little consolations now and then yeah it's incredible um, and and any words of wisdom to someone maybe who was raised in an Opus Dei family and who is now waking up and 
you know, wanting to start life anew. Plenty of Chanel number five, if they're a woman. No, um, but no, we, but there's more to that statement than, you know, we need to find the things that bring us sensory pleasure and true friendship. Mm. Um, I really true friendship, think, not friendship conditional upon allegiance. No, but if, if there's a problem there with trust, you just maybe have to take a risk every now and then. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I did suffer on and off with depression to a de in decreasing degree for years after I left. Mm -hmm. But um, the, a mistake I made was to hide away. And I learned eventually that you have to take the risk of yeah. being honest with somebody that you feel you might be able to trust. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and you mentioning a very important point for former cult members because one of the big casualties is a lack of trust when you when you get out of a group like this. Trust in others, but also trust in yourself. Absolutely. You know, and to realize it wasn't your fault, that it was not a healthy organization. You have to you have to learn to love yourself as if you were your own baby, <laughs> you know, as if uh, love yourself. I mean, I think that probably most people who've been in Opus Dei would be compassionate to other individuals, mm -hmm. um, because people join for very good reasons, and um, you have to apply that compassion to yourself. And, you know, the Christians are too prone to think of love thy neighbor as thyself and forget what that means, that mm -hmm. you, you can't love other people before you, you love yourself. Mm -hmm. And have a self. Until you love yourself. A lot of these groups, like the Moonies, and they think Opus Dei, they want you to deny yourself, you know? And, and, before, and if you're that young, you haven't even formed yourself yet. You're still, you know so young you're no you haven't you haven't mentally or in a or sexually or humanly and in opus day in in a way the worst mortifications might not have been the syllabus or the syllabus or the or the whipping yourself it was if you like sugar in your tea you don't have it and if you like marmalade on your toast you don't have it and so all of these essential deprivations hmm. and and then you know you can't listen to you can't watch certain types of films and you can't, you know, read certain things without getting special permission. And, you know, it's all very, very deprivating. And uh, that's yeah. why I think, and, you know, the, the cold shower in the morning, if there's one thing that, that my friends and family know about me is that I like nothing better than a nice warm bath. <laughs> uh -huh. So did, did members have to take cold showers every morning? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that jump out of bed very early in the morning, kiss the floor, and then go and have a cold shower, yeah. Mm. I had cold showers in the Moonies, uh, but... Uh, Did you? Yes, absolutely. And sometimes you had to be in it for eight minutes or 10 minutes, 12 Was minutes. that part of the regime? Uh, it was more punishment. Uh, you know, if you had a bad thought or you did a bad deed, you might be told you had to do this. And uh, I remember a few times where I was like blue. My, my, my skin was blue. I was shivering. As it was. I have been told that they've relaxed that rule, that it's now um, a voluntary thing for people to have a cold shower. I don't know. Yeah, it may be voluntary, but I bet the people who are uh, high up, you know, still want to demonstrate how great they are so they will do it and make everyone else feel guilty that they're not up to that standard. Just a guess. I don't know. But I, I, in the Moonies and in other cults, they're at a certain level inside in leadership, there's always a lot of competition for, for getting the goodies from the top and getting promoted. Um, well, um, 
Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Mm. I'm, I'm looking at some notes that I made about the yeah. bite model today. You look deep in thought. Anyway, I'm going to need to yeah. um, to go, but I want to thank you profoundly, and we'll be in touch uh, for sure. And uh, I'm interested in more stories about Opus Day. If you meet yes. a former member, I'd love to tell you more. But on the other hand, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should wait until my book comes out. <laughs> yeah, I keep people wanting more. We have to find <laughs> your publisher. Thank you so much, Eileen. Thank you. It was lovely speaking yeah, to you. Thank we'll you. be in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.